I think we've had people who've broken promises to us, or we may have been people who have broken promises to others. And I'm so thankful that we have a God who keeps his word. Amen. And in fact, we are talking tonight about this thing called faith and how when we live in fear, faith is nowhere on the radar because we're so stuck in fear. And on this leap day and this leap day weekend, we want to talk a little bit about how can we go from fear to faith. Yeah. But more than just that, it's, you know how Peter stepped out of the boat? We all have a boat somewhere. So tonight we're going to be talking about how do we step out of the boat. And we also want to uh, say thank you to Pastor John, Pastor Cindy for welcoming me here. I, I really appreciate you. Uh, you guys have wonderful pastors. And uh, just with what is happening here, uh, it resonates to the world. Sometimes you can be comfortable here attending church, even giving and contributing, forgetting that it, it, it ripples into the world. So... Pastor John, Pastor Cindy, we're so grateful for you. Really appreciate you. So take out your notes with us as we jump right in into how do we step out of the boat. And all of you who are online, we will also welcome you too. You know, when you think about stepping out of the boat, if you're a fisherman, uh, you don't do that. You don't step out of the boat. So for Peter to experience that, it wasn't, a, it wasn't common language to say to a fisherman, step out of the boat. But Peter was the only one out of all the disciples who stepped out of the boat. And because of that, we can learn how we too can take that leap of faith and not just, just you know, step out of the boat or our comfort zone, but, but accomplish something great for God and become who God sees us to be. Have you ever seen these shows that they, they, they don't renovate a house? It's more like they show the people what their home could look like and they, they put together a, like a computer model, and then they'll say, okay, we're going to put these walls just based upon what you have spoken to us. This is your flavor. You're going to have some walls that are going to be gray and, and some green walls, and you know, there's some gold trimming here, and you're going to have this kind of furniture. And then you have one family that will come, and they'll say, oh, that's not going to work. Are you going to have gray walls, green things, and the gold trimming? That's not going to work. And what does they get yellow coming down? That's not going to look good. That's not going to work. And you bring a Filipino, they're like, oh my goodness, this is beautiful. <laughs> this is good. This is, why? Because they, just the way they operate and maybe the, the feeling that they have, that they have two different perspectives, same building, same room, but because of the different perspectives, they receive it differently. And it's just like us, even as believers, we have the same God, same promises, but all of our perspectives are all different. So instead of looking at fear from our perspective, let's look at fear from God's perspective because he never changes. We're going to go through different emotions, but God is foundational. He never changes. He's stable and he's sure. He's truthful. And sometimes we rely on what we're used to, what we're comfortable with, what's convenient or safe or even secure or logical or what's controllable, that we've always done it this way. Let's read the scripture together, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, because this will help us with what we're going to be talking about this evening. And let's read it together loud and clear. Ready? Go. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. He earnestly rewards those who seek him. So Peter, while he was in the boat, in fact, we're going to read the story. It's found in Matthew chapter 14. While Peter was in the boat, which is very comfortable, it started to become a little uncomfortable. And I'll read from verse 22, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. It says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, after he had dismissed them, he went up on, he went up, up upon, or up on a mountainside, I think I need glasses, <laughs> he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. 
But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiping him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. It's, it's, it starts off pretty interesting. Let me give you the stages of what they went through. They went from, they crowd out in fear. Then Jesus brings the assurance, take courage, it is I. And then he says, don't be afraid. But then Peter brings the if. If it is you, then tell me to come to you on the water. Like something impossible. Tell me to do what you're doing. I, I want to do what you're doing. So tell me to come to you on the water. If it's you. Because I think we, we, that's how we respond with, to Jesus sometimes. If it is you, if you are real, if you do love me, if you do care for me, then do this for me. If you are who you say you are, then why is this happening? If you are the healer, then how come this healing is not taking place? If you are the provider, why aren't you providing? Like we add the if, and Jesus still says, come. Now, we may read this story and think, wow, that's pretty cool. Peter walked on water. It looked really good. And I, I wonder what it would be like. Now, I, some of you had the, the privilege of going to Israel, and I have a, a video of when, when I was there. This is, uh, we're on a boat, a vessel, going out into the Sea of Galilee, where Peter and the disciples were. And while we're out there, by the way, the water has receded, but that's the shoreline, and, and that mountain is where Jesus was on, and then he came walking to them on this water. It was not this calm. But I looked out on the boat and uh, on the water, and I thought, there's no way I would just jump out of the boat and walk on that water. There's no way I would have done that. And this is calm water. Peter and the disciples, the disciples were there with the storm yeah. and the waters. And Peter said, if that is you, tell me to come. Right. And Jesus said, come. And Peter did. Peter experienced something that no one else ever experienced. Now, whether it was... Peter's, uh, just his, his, his willingness to risk, or it was, if it was Peter's courage, or whatever it was, whatever Peter had inside of him, he was able to walk on water. But then as the Bible says, he began to look at all the wind and the waves, and then beginning to sink, he cried out to Jesus. He started sinking because he took his eyes off of Jesus. See, if we don't step out of the boat... Someone else will. Yeah. If we don't step out of the boat, someone else will. And we'll just watch them walk on water. But why not be the people that step out of the boat and walk on water with Jesus? And what that looks like in our everyday life is that's what we're going to kind of unpack. Is you find out what is your boat? What, what do you fear the most? What, where is your comfort for your life? Or where is your comfort when it comes to the way you think? What, what are you comfortable with that... You're not willing to risk for the sake of God, for the sake of your relationship with Christ. What are we so comfortable with that we're unwilling to take a risk in that way? I think every single one of us, it doesn't matter where we are in the boat of life, we can all step out of the boat and walk in the promises of God. And here's how. We're going to look at three things that will help us. And if you're taking notes, here's the first thing. Take courage, but wait for the Lord. Take courage, but wait for the Lord. See, courage in itself is not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, once you take courage, you can walk on water. You can do anything. All things are possible. He says, no, no, no. It's going to be with me. Take courage, but wait for the Lord. We actually need courage to face our fears. But at the same time, fear is a part of the process we, we know that courage is not the absence of fear, but it's moving forward in spite of our fears. I like how General Patton said it. He said, courage is fear holding on just one minute longer. 
And what he means by that is you're still going to have some fear and that the little bit of fear that's there that, that helps us to hold on just a little bit longer, it, it causes us to pause a little bit to make some wise decisions lest we fall into the foolishness category. You know, people say, no more fear, no fear, no fear, no fear. Let us do it. Let's go. Woo! No fear. Next day, hey, how's it? I stay in the hospital. Uh, I stay on body cast. Yeah, no fear. And jump and uh, forgot my parachute. So I kind of rode on the hill, but I popped back up. Like, you still need, God gave us this mechanism of fear, but not to stay there. Fear is okay, but unhealthy if we stay there. So there's a way for us to, yeah, take courage because Jesus is going to do something. But we have to wait for him. We have to wait for the Lord because he knows what's coming up. That's why we don't just jump and leap. We wait upon the Lord. We had a tree house, and when I was, you know, growing up, some of us, you know, we would play in tree houses and, and make this fort and things. But we had a rope on, on, on the tree, and the only way you could get to the rope is if you jumped. And what, what normally would happen is if somebody did jump or someone would climb to the top and climb down and get some inertia, we had another level that if we jumped to the rope, we would swing and then jump and then land on the other one and then the rope would continue to swing and you would be the next person and the longer you waited for that rope to swing the further away it got from you so you wanted to as quick as possible jump but not too quick where you mistime it and then you jump and it's leaving and then it's oh no but we're only like you know 30 pounds at that time so we bounce back up from the bushes but you want enough to make a decision that you're not just going into anything. We just, oh, I have the, all the faith in the world. We still need to wait upon the Lord. Psalm 27, verse 14 tells us to wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. See, God gives us, he's like that, that, the, the spiritual fuel the nutrients needed for us to take courage, to make those decisions because of the fear that takes us over. He's, he's what is needed for us to live the life that he promised us. That's why we always talk about being in the word of God, do our devotions and, 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 and make sure that we're hearing God because he feeds our soul. If, we, if he doesn't feed our soul, then we have no, no nutrients when we need to make decisions. We're just basing our decisions off of emotion. A couple years ago, I learned about having enough nutrients. Uh, on Saturday, I ate a light meal because I, I'll speak on Sunday morning. And so I had a light dinner. And then Sunday morning, I don't eat because I'm, I'm speaking. So all I had in the morning was something small. I had like an acai bowl. So after church, uh, we'll play basketball. And by then, it's about 1.30, 2 o'clock. So we'll get up at about you know, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, and then after our services, and same thing like you have on Sunday morning, 7, 9, and 11. So by the time come the afternoon, I have not, in, I have not, I have not eaten a lot. So we'll play basketball. That day, though, we played basketball for about three hours, and we, we will run hard because as you get older, you just want to lose weight. You, just don't, you don't want to, it's not about winning and dominance. It's, I just want to exercise. So at the end of this, I'm taking off my shoes. My friend sits next to me and he says this. So one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> it's like, let's go. So I put my shoes back on. He says, no, no, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. I said, you, you cannot just play and, oh, challenge me one-on-one -on -one and then that's it. So I put my shoes back on. I said, let's go. So I don't, I don't want to tell you who won because I'll be bragging. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who won. <laughs> so we play hard. We play hard. So after that, I had to pick up my wife, Heidi, uh, from the airport. So I drive to the airport, and I park where, you know, the cell phone lot is. You, you just wait, and then the air, airplane comes in. So I'm waiting there, and I catch a cramp on my leg. So I step out of my truck. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. So I start stretching out my calf. I stretch out my calf my quad, my, my, uh, my hamstring starts to cramp. So I try to stretch my hamstring. My quads, my, my thigh starts cramping. So now I'm by the truck trying to 
trying to stretch out, and I can't. Now, I, I, there are other cars around, and I'm thinking, I wonder if someone's seeing me. So I try to hide from the truck, uh, hide, hide in back of the truck, but then you have the, the road here that people are passing by. So now I start trying to stretch out, trying to be cool, like everything's good, and, and then my back starts cramping up. I'm like, whoa, my back? And then I'm trying to stretch my back. My other leg cramps up. My toes start cramping up. I'm thinking my, my toes, and then my arms, hands, neck starts cramping up. Now I'm having a hard time breathing, and then all of a sudden, my abs, which I don't have, starts to cramp. And I'm trying to breathe, and it's like a, like a anaconda squeeze. And now I'm, I can't breathe. I'm, I'm trying to breathe. That takes place for a couple of minutes, and then it subsides. I'm like, oh, that was, that was interesting. About 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, again it happens, and it repeats again and again. I think the third time, by this time, it's about an hour later. I'm sweating. I call out to Jesus. Have you ever been in a situation where that's all you got? It's like, okay, my Gatorade is gone. My water is gone. Jesus, help me. That's how I was speaking. I couldn't even speak. By then, my wife shows up. My brother-in-law shows up. They're looking at me like, what's going on? I'm like, I cannot breathe. I cannot breathe. They're like, what in the world? They're like, what are you, possessed? I'm like, I cannot, I can't, I'm catching cramps. So they call the, the uh, EMT or they, they call the ambulance. The ambulance comes and, and all of the workers. And, and thank God, if you work EMT, if you're one of the technicians and you, you, you're um, uh, what do they call EMT, right? Okay, so they come here. If you, I'm so thankful for you guys, and you guys are so calm. I'm here panicking, like, okay, give me something. I, I, I can't breathe. And they're like, okay, so um, you want to go up to the hospital? Or you want your wife to drive you? What do you mean? I, I, I got to do something. I said, well, you're going to have to go in this gurney. And I said, okay, I can't even move. I can't, even, I can't go in the gurney. I said, or your wife can drive you. I'm going to go in the gurney. So... <laughs> I jump on the gurney and they put me into the ambulance. My legs start shaking. My hands start shaking. I'm hitting the guy in the leg. His name is David. He's like, what is your name? I'm like, David, first of all, sorry, that's not, I'm not grabbing the leg. That's nice. I cannot control that. So I'm, I'm doing that and he takes my name and they take me to the hospital and instantly they put an IV in and give me some potassium and magnesium and my body just <sighs> relaxes. I'm like, yeah, I can buy some of these. I can play basketball. Just hook up that pack to me. The doctor says, what did you eat yesterday and what did you eat today? And so I tell her, and she looks at Heidi. She doesn't look at me. She says, basically what happened is your husband had zero calories, no nutrients in his body. That's why he went through this. And my wife was like, or he cannot play basketball anymore. I'm like, what, what is that? Where's the compassion? But when she said that, when she said, you don't have enough nutrients, I thought, that's just like me spiritually. That if I don't wait on the Lord, I am spiritually depleted of all calories and nutrients because I don't wait on the Lord. I make my decisions based upon emotion and I make my decisions based upon what sounds good and what I think may work. Or I'm courageous enough. Step out. I'm courageous. But I never wait on the Lord. It's very important for us to understand that Jesus was there when Peter stepped out of the boat. Jesus didn't say, take courage. Shoots. <laughs> and then left. Jesus stayed there because without Jesus, Peter could not walk on the water. Take courage, but wait. Wait on the Lord. The second thing is to come to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's not, sometimes we come to Jesus because we want him to solve something. We come to Jesus because we're going through a difficult time, which, by the way, is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at all. The problem is if I don't come to Jesus for Jesus and I come to Jesus for, to, for him to solve my problem only, then when my problem is solved, I don't need Jesus anymore. I, I, I can't tell you how often I'll counsel people and then say, oh man, I, this, this is going to be the change. I'm going to change because, oh, God spoke to me and I'm going to change. You know, I lost, I, I don't have my children with me. Me and my wife are, you know, we're going through a difficult time. We're separated, but I'm going to be in the word of God so that he brings my family together. And I said, that's a good goal. 
but not the wisest one. What? Oh, you know, God wants us to be together. I said, yeah, yeah, but if you're coming to Jesus and that's your goal, what if that never happens? Or what if it does happen and that was your goal? You think you're still going to follow Jesus? Or the fact that he brought everybody together, now you got what you needed, now you don't need Jesus anymore. See, when Peter went to Jesus, he was there strictly for Jesus. Peter's motive wasn't to walk on water. That wasn't his motive. His motive was to come to Jesus. If that's you, tell me to come. And sometimes our motive is Jesus, the problem solver. Yeah. Not Jesus, our Savior, our Lord. Yeah. The, one whom the one who died for us and the one we come to just because we want this relationship with him. That's the difference between relationship and religion. Yeah. Our relationship with Jesus is the most important relationship because every relationship comes out of that one. Yeah. So if you want a strong marriage, this relationship with Jesus needs to be strong. Come to Jesus because he is lifelong. And that's what he was saying to Peter. Come. Come. That's why he says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus himself says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yeah, come to me. Come to me. Then when Jesus said to, to the disciples, he said, he said, do not be afraid. Take courage. When he says take courage, that phrase means be of good cheer or to have confidence. Jesus could say that because Jesus was there. His presence was there. It wasn't just about the courage. It was about being of good cheer. Why? Because Jesus is bigger than the storm. So he could say, take, take courage. Or be of good cheer. Have confidence because your confidence is in me. But along the way, Peter took his eyes off of Jesus. He started to see the wind and the waves, and then that's when he began to sink. But Jesus continually welcomes us and says to be of good cheer. Be confident because of who I am. That you're going to wait for me. But be of good cheer. Because even though the wind and the waves come, it's not going to overtake you. Yeah. See, courage is needed for us to make those kinds of decisions. We're going to need courage. But we're also going to need Jesus along the way. And sometimes we think, well, if I can just get out of the boat, then I'll be okay because I'll be walking on water. No, we come to Jesus. See, we actually don't need courage to come to Jesus. Courage comes after we come to Jesus. We can come to Jesus with all of our fears, all of our insecurities, all of our doubts, all of our, the, 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 the loneliness that we feel. We, we come to him with, with uh, 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 even, even our past, we can come to him with. Yeah. Courage comes after, but Jesus is the foundation. And Peter, being the only disciple who was willing to step out of that comfort of the boat, was the only one who came close to Jesus. He was willing to do so. And many of us, I believe here, we may not have the courage right now to come to Jesus. That's okay. Because when you come to Jesus, he'll provide the courage. That's why he said, take courage. It is I. We need him for that. Come to Jesus. You won't be disappointed. The third thing that helps us is to remember to process our emotions with Jesus. With Jesus. That's why he said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. See, the, the, the fear part, he gave us that. God gave us an emotion called fear. So we need fear. But when he said, do not be afraid, that phrase or that word afraid, he was using it in the context of don't, don't be stuck there. Don't be stuck with fear. Because if our fear is not dealt with and if we don't come to Jesus, then we become paralyzed then we don't make decisions, then we don't know where to go from there. But because of Jesus, and because he's the one that says, I want you to process your emotions with me. I've, I've, I've seen so often that 
People will process their emotions with other people. You go to work or maybe, maybe your husband is, maybe your husband is like the worst person in the world right now. Right now. Not the husband's here. Not the husband's here. Elsewhere. Just hypothetically. And you guys are going through the most difficult time and then you go to work and someone says, hey, what's wrong? Oh, my husband. Oh, my goodness. My husband. Driving me crazy. And your friends who may not know your husband might say things like, leave him. Leave him. We go party. Let's go, let's go movies. Let's go to the movies. We go clubbing. And now you're thinking, wait, what? No, I, that's not the advice I want. Or as men, you know, sometimes we don't want to express our emotions. In fact, I, we were watching a movie. I have three grandchildren, 10, 8, and 6. My, the middle one, 8 years old. While we're watching this movie, you know, it's, it's kind of noisy. It's an emotional scene. And then it becomes quiet. Zoom. Because of the scene, there's no background music, no, no dialogue, no talking. My grandson looks at me and says, Papa, are you crying? And like, everybody can hear you. <laughs> but in that, in that moment of emotion, we get emotional. And sometimes even as men, we don't want to process it with, uh, we don't want to process our emotions, so we don't know who to process it with. But then when we see our friends or other people and they're saying, hey, what's going on? Oh, this is happening, this is happening. They might not give us the best advice. Or we turn to something else that is not healthy for us. But when we process our emotions with Jesus, he does a really, really good job Amen. in processing. Yeah. Just like this, the fear that many people are having right now around the world with this coronavirus. Not the beer virus. This is a totally different virus. This is... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, I was in the elevator at one of the hotels, and as we're coming down, this person next to me coughs. Like this. <laughs> I'm like, at least cough in your shirt. <laughs> I was like ready to. <laughs> but now I was calm about it. But it's, it's just the fear of the unknown. What can happen? Possibilities. And, and we live with this. But then when we connect with Christ and we, we have this relationship with him, even though we're in a world filled with waves and wind and, and everything is beating up against us and all the pressures and all the unknowns and uncertainties, when we're with Christ, he's the source that not only protects us, but he's the one that gives us stability so that whatever fear we may have, fear of not being able to make ends meet, fear of, of not knowing how our children are going to get by or the health of my parents or I have to help with these things or these people or I have a deadline for this at work. I have all of these different fears. Because I have Jesus, I just process my emotions with him. It's so different from the way of the world because while the world is running mad, we're here with the Lord one-on-one, -on -one, listening to every word that he's speaking yeah. and finding hope in him. That's what it means to step out of the boat. You're not just stepping out of the boat. You're stepping out of the boat walking towards someone. Lest we become what we feel. Rather than processing our emotions with the Lord. Otherwise, we become schizophrenic Christians. We cannot process, we cannot take the right processes and, and then process it emotionally where we're going, going to make the right decisions. There's a breakdown. And so now even as believers, we don't know what to do and we don't know how to act. And the world looks at it and says, what's the difference? The difference should be that we are the secure ones because we have Jesus, because we were willing to step out of the boat, whatever, whatever your boat may be. And I pray tonight that we'll be able to at least draw one step closer to Jesus so that as we come to him, everything else starts to fall into place. All the fears are taken away. Why? Because perfect love casts out all fear. Yes. And whatever fears you may face, he's able to. Trust him because he knows exactly what needs to be done so that our fears no longer capture us, but that his love does. His grace does. We just need to be willing to leave our comforts for the sake of walking towards Christ, leaping towards him and trusting in him. Step out of the boat. Whatever is comforting to you, whatever is familiar or assuring, 
we may have to step out of that. Or, or when, they, when they stepped onto water, stepping onto water is, is like what is impossible, what seems impossible, what's never been done before. Because if we're ever going to get to a place we've never been, we've got to do things we've never done. And how do we get to that place in our marriages and our families? The wind and the waves are our present circumstances or even our future that seems unknown or, or what our flesh feels, the pressures that we have. That's why I love what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, what? Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. And then let's read this part together. Ready? Go. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Take courage. Wait on the Lord, but process your emotions with Jesus. And instead of staying in the boat with, with anger or resentment, step out of the boat. Forgive. Let go. Live the life that God, prom live the life God promised you. Or are we just going to watch other people and watch God and his blessings fade from us because we're unwilling. It's out of the boat where we experience life with Christ. Instead of staying in the boat of pride, step out of the boat and humble ourselves before God. We get stuck in our, our boat of pride. And instead of staying in the boat when God calls us to follow his lead, step out of the boat, serve, volunteer, get connected. I mean, you might be even thinking, I, 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 don't, I don't know how to step out of the boat. It's, 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 it might be dangerous. What if God does something with my life? Yeah, what if he does? Step out of the boat. Crawl out of the boat. Roll out of the boat. Just somehow get out of the boat because he's going to do something powerful. That's how good he is. Step out of the boat. Risk sinking. Because sinking with Jesus right there is a whole lot better than standing on your two feet while you're still in the boat. We go nowhere. Oh, and by the way, it wasn't Jesus who sank. It was Peter. Jesus is unsinkable. And even when we sink... He's right there, immediately reaching out his hands, ready to bring us up. Because walking with Jesus on water is not just a powerful moment. It is beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. Because he has a life that he promised for every single one of us. And it doesn't matter what your boat looks like. It could be filled with holes. It could be brand new. It doesn't matter. The boat nowhere compares to walking with Jesus. Amen.